Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Monroe Carmen. I'm president of the Press Club and editor-at-large at Bloomberg Business News. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Uh, before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of some upcoming speakers. Tomorrow, June 8th, film critics Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert will mark the 20th anniversary of their television show with their view of the state of the movie industry. And speaking of movies, on Friday, June 16th, actress Sharon Stone, who will be in town for the annual National Race for the Cure, will talk about wellness, fitness, and a positive attitude. And on Thursday, June 22nd, Robert Wright, the president of NBC, will discuss television in the changing society. Transcripts and audio and video tapes of Press Club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-NPC-2334, that's a new number, 1-800-NPC-2334, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions for our speakers, please write them on the cards that are provided at your table, pass them up to me and I will ask as many as time permits. And now I'd like to introduce our head table and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, uh, Cynthia Ramsey of the American Petroleum Institute. Llewellyn King, Publisher King Publishing Group. Maria Riccio, Fort Worth Star Telegram. Donald Blinken, the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Hungary. Richard Whittle of the Dallas Morning News. Uh, Mr. Bakros, the Minister of Finance of the Republic of Hungary, has not been able to arrive yet, but we hope he still will join us during the program. Uh, skipping over our speaker, Mark Johnson, Media General News Service and Chairman of the NPC Speakers Committee. Uh, Georgi uh, Banlaki, Ambassador the, of the Republic of Hungary. Uh, Bill Hickman, a member of the National Press Club uh, Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Nancy Dunn of the Financial Times. Uh, Martin Chase, Kiplinger Washington Editors. And Douglas Harbre Harbrecht of Business Week Magazine. <laughs> Our speaker today is a most intriguing individual. He is a former communist. He helped to put down the uprising by Hungarian freedom fighters against Soviet rule in 1956. He is a socialist and heads the Socialist Party in this country. On the surface, these appear to be an improbable set of credentials for the man that Hungarians have chosen to lead them in the new political landscape of Europe that sees the rough and tumble economics of the free market as the avenue to prosperity. Yet, take a close look at what Gula Horn has been doing since he became Prime Minister of his country last July. In March, his government announced an austerity program designed to reduce the annual budget deficit and the public debt. He's proposed cuts in government spending, including spending for welfare. He's letting energy prices rise to market levels. And he's seeking to privatize as many state-run companies and industries as he can. Prime Minister Horn also encourages as much foreign investment in his country as he can, which is a principal reason for his visit to the United States this week. Indeed, Mr. Horn fits in well with today's Washington. Given his recent program, he might even qualify as a Republican. <laughs> to emphasize the capitalist nature of his visit, 
Mr. Horn is accompanied by Finance Minister Laios Bakros and Central Bank President George Saranyi. They are regarded as the dream team, the intellectual brain trust behind the new financial program. Hungary indeed holds particular appeal for foreign investors. It has attracted almost 50% of all foreign investment in the Central European region since democracies there began to cast off the Soviet yoke some six years ago. And most of that foreign investment has come from the United States. Mr. Horn has also expressed his interest in having his country join both NATO and the European Union. Hungary, a landlocked nation of 10 million people, also is very much affected by the current Balkan crisis. That war that is devastating Bosnia could spill over into other countries in the area, including Hungary, despite the best efforts of Europeans to isolate the battle. Perhaps Mr. Horn will give us his views on the appropriate American role in Bosnia. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the National Press Club podium the Prime Minister of Hungary, Gula Horn. Elnök úr, Hölgyeim és Uraim! Köszönöm szépen ezt az ismertetést. Ez igaz. Még ha az igazság a szélesebb és teljesebb is. Uh, even though the truth is wider and broader based, I agree that I could quite easily become an area uh, republican. Nos, well, we have been in the United States of America for three days and a half. These three days and a half, most part of which I have spent, we have spent with the leaders of your country, to me has been most informative. Why, you may ask me? Primarily because Mert önöknek olyan elnökök van. Because you have got a president in your country. Clinton elnök úr. Uh, president Clinton. Olyan admin adminisztrációk van. You have got an administration. You have got a government. És olyan kongresszusok. And you have got a congress. Amelyek érdemben foglalkoznak. Which közép deal in merit with the East Central European region. Abban az értelemben. In the sense hogy konkrét cselekvést folytatnak. That you do concrete actions. Az ottani változások megerősítése. To strengthen the changes there. Az átalakulási folyamat nagyon nehéz feladatainak megvalósításába való. To materialize and support and assist the process of transformation in the region. Ez nem mindig volt jellemző. This has not been a characteristic feature of all American administrations, and we are very much appreciate this. I can say that on the experience of yesterday and on earlier days' experience. It is well known that U.S. now is the only global power in the world with huge potentials, opportunities, be it economic, political or military. I think that the American leadership recognized that this global role presents a major challenge and also a kind of moral obligation uh, for the various ongoing processes in the various parts of the world. I must also add, this is not only an obligation, but this is also an opportunity for the U.S. because of its size and strength to fulfill these obligations. Why do I emphasize this? Because in my judgment that the East Central European region from Russia to Poland uh, and uh, from Poland down to Bulgaria, this region 
In this region, the key duty, the key challenge is how we shall manage to implement transformation. This region that has a lot of instable elements should be able to succeed the process of stabilization. Largely depends on the stability of the European continent. And European stability is a decisive element of the stability of the world. As far as we are concerned, Mr. President, it is true, many of the present leaders in the East Central European region were former communists, including myself. I would also like to add right away that at the same time, these communists, these are the reform communists that started, launched reforms both in Hungary and elsewhere in the region. They, they did out of their own will and energy, cause of democracy, freedom, and uh, did the transition. In 1988, uh, bills were adopted in Hungary about the freedom of enterprise, about the uh, freedom of political and uh, economic uh, freedom enterprise at the time when the Warsaw Pact still existed. And uh, the Comic Con also existed. The reform, due to the reform powers in Hungary, the people knew also in the past, and even more so now, they knew what market economy it was and is. Uh, we have got a tradition of 20 years at least in Hungary, of, and I would also like to add. To me, in that region, in our region, one of, one of the greatest, uh, greatly respected persons is Mikhail Gorbachev, who, in, in nine, when he came to office and following that in 1985, made a immense step and act that no one else in the region, perhaps no one in the world had the courage to do, and that was he gave up the earlier Soviet policy and practice which imposed the Soviet system, the Stalinist system on the allied countries. Gorbachev created possibilities of a free change of system for the countries of East Central Europe. To, for him, as a reformer, he has got a historic merit that those changes started and has reached the phase where they are now. Hundreds and thousands could be enumerated who have done a lot over the past period in the recent years for the sake of this transformation. Whatever has been created in the world, whatever has created the new situation in the relationship of world politics, these all can be due to mutual efforts which on the one hand the activity of our own internal reform forces on the other also the support of the Western democracies. I would like to emphasize that the, the political transformation takes place more easily and uh, during a shorter period of time than the economic social transformation. The political transformation means at the moment in the East Central European region that the states, including Hungary, very clearly committed 
the pattern, uh, for po multi-party system, parliamentarism, uh, state ruled by law and the implementation of human rights. The power structure, uh, the elements of power structures have been established, including the government. I am convinced that without any exception in all the countries, what uh, went on in these countries is irreversible. I would also like to add something. From the point of view of Hungary, this is why it is important since centuries, uh, this is the first time we are now in the situation, uh, in the second half of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, that we were free to decide about the construction of a social system that we chose for ourselves. Just in the same way as free, we freely decided whether we wanted to, want to join a alliance. No power dictates that on us because it, is, it comes from our own recognition, from our conviction. I want to underline this to make it clear that our accession to the NATO and the further role of the NATO in Europe does not mean primarily that the NATO wants to expand, wants to enlarge. But it means that the number of new countries apply now for membership in the NATO. One of these countries is Hungary. These countries, and I'm talking about on behalf of Hungary now, comply with the conditions and require requirements of NATO membership. I wish to underline, school, underline this because this is how NATO should approach the question. And it is hardly doubtful that the alliance does not have any ground to refuse our claim for membership in the alliance. As far as the economic social uh, transformation is concerned, I would like to uh, bring it to your kind attention that we are following an unbeaten track. Because actually what we are having now we started to build and we continue to build market economy. A market economy that is being built from the top down, that is managed from the top down to the bottom. Uh, you will kindly remember in Western Europe, in the West, it started from the grassroots level and the private enterprise came to in, into being and created what now exists in Western Europe, in the Western world. Uh, it is taking place in the reverse uh, order in Hungary. Let me just mention one example in this relation. A privatization of a scale that you can see in Hungary, neither in the world nor in the history has been exemplified yet. Practically, a complete, total, uh, centralized uh, state asset uh, we shall go to the dominance of private uh, ownership. It is the Hungarian government is determined that before the end of 1997, this uh, dominance will be created, which in practice means that that the sh share of the private sector in the GDP will reach about 75 up to about 80 percent. And without exception, practically every strategic branch, energy sector and others will be part of the privatization process. I would also like to stress this fact. This is important and this gives also a great opportunity to American investors to participate in this process of privatization.
It is extremely important also to bear in mind that this privatization tens and uh, hundreds of jobs are eliminated. Hundreds of thousands of jobs are uh, eliminated. Since uh, uh, 1992, 1,200,000 uh, jobs uh, were eliminated in Hungary. You know in the United States what jobs mean, what a challenge it is to any government uh, in a similar fashion to our government too. It is a vitally important for us to create new jobs be because outdated uh, uh, plants and factories have to be eliminated. At the same time, new modern uh, uh, companies have to be created and we need financial resources. In connection with this, we have got uh, discussions, disputes with the European Union. European Union says you can join us if you fulfill the conditions. These are very concrete and very strict conditions, not in general terms. Uh, how much the uh, deficit of the budget, the deficit of the current account can be? The conditions are justifiable, and, but it is also obvious that these conditions alone of our own strength are not able to fulfill. The West, without the contribution and cooperation of the West, we cannot do because there are no free financial resources available in the region and not in Hungary either. I would also like to add one thing. It is out of the question that this is not about egoist interest in the process of the uh, transformation. A kind of unilateral aid. Also, but I would like to underscore because there are misunderstandings around this. We are not talking about that uh, billions uh, of billions of money are put into the region in the form of support and aid. I know there are charitable support, there are charitable organizations. This is also very important. But what we offer and what happens in practice is none other than business. Because in Hungary and in other countries of the region, it is, uh, the market is extremely absorbent. I would also like to add, this is not a third world region, East Central Europe, because qualified skilled labor is available, alone in the Central European, not to count Ukraine, and uh, 120 million skilled labor, qualified labor is available. At the same time, as far as wages and salaries are concerned, they are extremely low. Very serious advantages conditions uh, are available for the potential investors. What we say that uh, we want a cooperation with the uh, West in an asymmetric way in economy and financial affairs. Asymmetric when the countries that have capital appear in the region invest and they will get back the profit and if it is necessary also their invested capital. This is a mutually beneficial business economic cooperation. The political importance of this is also very important because this is how we can mitigate and ease the huge social tensions coming from losing the jobs and coming from other conditions and factors. Because it is, it was also characteristic of previous years, the old regime, which in my opinion, which had two decisive negative features. One is the regime the regime was anti-democratic. The other was against uh, achievements and performance. Did not perform. Perform not in line with the expectations of the expectations of the society and the economy. Well, in connection with this latter one, I would like to stress 
that performance, achievement. We need techniques and technology development which indeed will not leave the region in a backward state. We also have to do away with the practice that a number of countries during the previous regime performance and the social care was financed from foreign loans. This cannot be maintained any longer. We all recognize it. And we determined to take further reform steps, which is brings in line the expenses with the actual achievements of the economy. This is again uh, Hungary that first recognized it. I hope they will recognize this also in other countries, uh, the necessity of this in other countries as well. And finally, let me say one more. Naturally, for our region, for Hungary, it is of key issue security. Security, which in many ways over the past years has not become stronger. However, I would even say that has shaken. No one thought that after a few decades, after finishing, ending the Second World War, the most senseless war will break out in Bosnia. Because this is a senseless, meaningless war. And, and, and During my discussions in Washington this year, we devoted a lot of attention to this issue too. Hungary, which is especially in a sensitive situation, because Serbia and Croatia are neighboring countries. Hundreds of thousands of Hungarians live there. To us, we have to follow a very clear and determined policy. We handle it. We, our approach to this question is that there should not be, should not stop the diplomatic political efforts. At the same time, the community of nations have to make more determined uh, steps in other areas to have a hope to end the war. I would like to underscore that this security and this security challenge at the same time also means that East Central Europe will be destined for failure if against each other if they want to ensure their own uh, security against the interest of others. We never ever needed so much then nowadays that the states of East Central Europe should try to materialize, implement uh, the policy of historic reconciliation. There have been various bad feelings in the region, the Hungarians have got in connection with the neighbors, so do the neighbors in connection with us. We can't help about this. The present generation, the present policy can han cannot help. Uh, our opinion is, if we just look back into the past and licking the old wounds, we shall not have energy to solve the present problems. We have got to look to the future. We have got to reconcile with the neighbors. We have got to make symbolic steps. And we have got to prove that we are not cross with each other. Because I'm convinced we have to demonstrate towards the developed countries that we are not killing each other. But we are annihilating and eliminating our problems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. 
Uh, you spent years as a diplomat in Yugoslavia, the yeah, former the, the, the Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia. How do you view the war there? Are the, are the UN and the United States following the correct policies? And will American troops be required? <coughs> Yes, indeed, as a diplomat, I spent six years in Yugoslavia. It's an extremely nice country. May I tell you that, in my opinion, basically there are two keys. There are two key issues in connection with the Yugoslav crisis now. One is that Serbia or smaller Yugoslavia and the government headed by Milosevic what is his relationship to the Bosnian situation and to the struggles and fights led by the Bosnian Serbs? It is my conviction that it is in, this, in the interest of Serbia, that it is their vital interest to f uh, completely isolate the aggressors. The most important duty, one of the most important duties of the international community would be to convince of this the Serbian leadership. It can also be a guarantee that the war will come to an end within the foreseeable future. The other, uh, the United Nations was correct and I think Every military enterprise or act is acceptable in the case if it is based on the resolution of the United Nations, because United Nations is democratic and brings in a democratic fashion on behalf of the uh, nations uh, of the United Nations. At the same time, we also have to consider that the possibilities of the UN are uh, rather limited. They don't have the means and instruments like the NATO does. Whoever criticizes those recent steps taken, I would like to bring it to the, the kind attention of those. The further steps could be taken in order to f end the war that right now we cannot uh, safely say that will take us to the good end. Uh, the situation is very special there and there are all sorts of means and ways and they have to be tested before we find the most adequate one. And the question of sending U.S. troops to Bosnia. Yes or no or maybe? I do not want to interfere into the internal policy of the United States. Uh, then a question about the arms embargo. Should it be lifted so the Bosnian Muslims can defend themselves? I do not agree with any suspension or lifting before we have got evidence that willing to implement and enforce the decisions of the uh, of the community of nations. Is there a Hungarian minority in the territory of? The former Yugoslavia? How large is it and where is it? And what is its status in the current conflict? <coughs> yes, there is about 600,000 living on the former Yugoslavia, most of them living in Vojvodina in Serbia, also in Croatia and in Slovenia. I would like to tell you that everywhere in the world the situation is, if there is a conflict somewhere, it is always the minorities who have to carry bear the greatest sacrifice. And now the situation, the plight of the Hungarians, uh, the war aggravates their situation furthermore. Masses of young Hungarians were conscripted 
And it is not by chance. And in our bilateral Serbian-Hungarian relations, we did raise the issue with them. There are problems also in the field of ensuring their rights, primarily in Serbia. If the situation eases, we are ready to conduct normal dialogue and normal relations with Serbia. How worried are you that the fighting in Bosnia will spread to Hungary and other Central European countries? No, there is no reality, thank God. How is, how is your relationship with Boris Yeltsin? Can he survive politically? Well, I would like to ask you to ask him personally. Are extremist political groups such as ultra-nationalists forming in Hungary as they are in other former East Bloc countries? There are in a small number extremist groups, there are in small number. But, but, but the good news is they are not represented in the Hungarian parliament. They participated in the election campaign last spring, but neither group managed to get even one seat in the parliament. The Hungarian people are wise enough to reject and to, to refuse these extremists and does not ensure any political background to them. Uh, turning to your privatization program, is there resentment building within your country over selling state-run enterprises to foreign investors? There are disputes, for instance, in connection with the electricity board, electricity company and the supply of electricity. There have been various trade union positions that this should not be given to foreign hands. I would like to add that, for instance, in France, also French partners tell that uh, the, uh, the uh, electricity, they want to keep it in 100% state property. Our opinion is that the whole electricity industry needs reconstruction, the power stations, uh, the network and others that all these without the involvement of foreign capital cannot be modernized. This is the reason why we need to involve foreign capital and in my judgment the majority, overwhelming majority of the society approves of it. Can you tell us why your government stopped the sale of Hungar hotels to U.S. investors, and what kind of a and what kind of a message does that send? Thank you very much for putting this question. First, there was a misunderstanding in the press in connection with this question because uh, in connection with the Hungar hotels the owner they did not assume any obligation to sign a contract. The government intervened, intervened not at a time when there was a valid contract. The second thing I would like to say, the investigation that had to be done and that had been started by me personally, the justification for that was that there was a grounded suspicion that uh, law was violated when the tender was issued and when uh, the uh, tenders were evaluated. So the law was violated and the investigation 
justified that it so the uh, laws were violated that were in effect and let me just add a third important element that practically out of this particular out of this privatization which meant uh, selling 15 hotels we could hardly derive any revenue, that is the Republic of Hungary. And actually we are not talking about slums or huts or very poor hotels. World standard hotels were among them on the River Danube, hotels that were built, financed partly or fully from the foreign loans that we are now repaying. So we are paying for that, we Hungarians, the costs of building these hotels. This is why it is not all the same to us when privatized to have a realistic price, not some outdated old building. I would also tell you, finally, that it was obvious that there were contradictory and, and there were loopholes in uh, legislation on privatization. This is why the new government submitted a new bill on privatization, which was adopted on the 9th of May. And this makes it absolutely clear which are the cases when there is a need or there is no need for central interference. What we want, and this enable uh, the legislation gives, a, we want that the government should not, that there should no be, there should not be a need to interfere unless there is a violation of the law. Is your country having more success at privatizing and creating a free market than Russia has had? And if so, why? I must tell you honestly, I have never ever in my life re received a question like this. Because the two countries cannot be compared. How do they privatize in Russia? I was uh, uh, quite recently uh, paying a visit to the southern part of Russia. They privatize a company that employed uh, 38,000 people, which means that they turned the company into a shareholding company. Every employee, the 38,000 uh, employees received their own shares. And with this, they declared the privatization process completed. How they managed to produce one dollar of profit, and they were not able to tell me that, how they are going to modernize that company, because they could not answer that question to me. This is one thing I... This is a difference between Hungarian and Russian privatization. The other thing, that in Russia, they do not know what market economy is. Now they are trying to learn something about that. In Russia, market economy was something that they call host market. Somebody went to the market and bought four potatoes or tomatoes. That was market economy in Hungary. We have market economy for the past 20 years. And the institutions of market economy have been gradually established. Do I need to tell you any more details? I think we could sit together until next afternoon. Did you voluntarily embrace your current austerity program and appeal for foreign investment as an economic model or was, it, or was it foisted on you by the International Monetary Fund and the Western governments? Both. To be quite honest, both reasons. Partly, it was our own recognition, the essence of which is we cannot spend more than we have enough money to spend. 
Gondolom a családok is így élnek Amerikában. I think this is how families live in America. They can spend as much as much the wife and the husband earn. If they don't do that, if we've got uh, debts, that's going to be a bad situation. So this is how, if we spend more, we shall have debts. And the interest rates are becoming higher and higher, and we shall be in the red. So that was the process going on, and we recognize that process. On the other hand, the Western countries and the international financial institutions demanded that we should change. So actually the two met, own recognition and the demands of the banks and the financial institutions. Let me also add, a government must also be good-hearted. De nem lehet egy kormány sem jótékonyság intézni. But no government can be a charitable organization or institution. Just like the international financial organizations are not charitable humanitarian organizations. They demand what the partners should do. Has the United States government done enough? to encourage new industries, especially high-tech industries, to invest and develop in Eastern Europe. Has done enough, and they must do, uh, that has to continue, because we have still a lot ahead of us in Eastern, East Central Europe. I would also like to add, naturally, uh, the role of the government is much smaller than the role of the big companies on both sides. So in, our, in Hungary, in your country, that the government has got to make certain conditions more favorable. For us, for instance, it is necessary to preserve certain institution elements, to maintain GSP, to support our accession to the OECD. This is what the governments can do. And naturally, they can also do that they set up certain funds and recapitalize in the auspices of government guarantees, but these are not of decisive importance. What is decisive? That the big companies, what they do. I would like to emphasize two things. We are not only talking that the, the as far as the volume of investment is concerned, the American uh, investors uh, are take the first place. If I were an American, I would be very careful to f uh, preserve this first place. But it is also that the American companies uh, make investments which create a lot of jobs. And this is extremely important, as I mentioned earlier. Secondly, that indeed techniques, high-tech technology, the newest uh, developments of the high technology are brought in the country, not the uh, ones uh, going back to many years ago, the ones are discarded. I can enumerate companies like General Electric, IBM, Ford, etc. Thank you. Now, can you give us uh, some idea of when you hope to join the European Union and NATO? Do you have a timetable in mind? And secondly, secondly, what do you see as the purpose of an expanded NATO? As far as the first question is concerned, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning on the 24th of December, the year 2000, as a Christmas gift, we are ready to sign the agreement with the European Union on our accession. If we meet then, we can justify uh, we can see whether this prediction has come true. 
Like as far as we are concerned, we shall do our utmost to comply with the conditions. Uh, a lot now, uh, it's up to the European Union. The relations are progressing well. The Visegrad group and the associated countries are present there in every important uh, 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 that in the structural institutions of the EU. As far as the expansion of the NATO is concerned, I'm convinced that it is not only Hungary or other exceeding countries will have a uh, benefit, but it is also good for the NATO. It's a great spiritual, physical capacity that we bring in if we are members in the NATO. Our knowledge, know-how, experience uh, of the region of the world, whether it will further expand the opportunities uh, for a greater role in uh, Europe. I'm convinced if NATO takes it serious that they have to assume responsibility for the international or European processes. They cannot close the doors to accept uh, new applicant countries. Last question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, before we get to the last question, a few gifts, a certificate of appreciation for being Thank with us much. today. A National Press Club mug, uh, which uh, will enable you to either drink coffee or solicit funds for investment in your country. Thank you very much. And finally, uh, some of the most famous photographs of our presidents taken by American photographer George Thames. Last question. Uh, the questioner says that the freedom of the press rating of your country has fallen in recent times. What can you say about why the freedom of the press has fallen and what is the future for more freedom opportunities for the press? I know it's going to, it is difficult to believe what I'm going to say. It is not only governments can, that can make a mistake, but also a, a newspaper can also make a mistake or a journalist can make a mistake. I know. I always said, don't they get cross with journalists because I will be on the losing side. So a uh, politician get into controversy with them, and I think I always uh, managed to do so. I am sorry that Freedom House is not fully aware, of it, and uh, they are kindly invited to, to uh, talk in Hungary. Let me tell you two things. One is that this government, this government was the one that uh, during 11 months put an end to two papers, actually three, which have nothing to do with the government and financed by the government. And I would like to emphasize there is no daily paper now which would not criticize very strictly the government. It is not like this in the US. Everybody praises the president and the administration, but in Hungary we have not yet reached this stage. As far as broadcast media is concerned, we have inherited that the, we have to subsidize them from the budget, the television and the radio. Uh, the parliament acts. The pres and appoints the uh, uh, presidents of the radio television. The media bill is in front of the parliament already. It's up to the parliament now when they adopt it. We hope and it is our intention. It is expressed also in the bill. It will be completely independent of the uh, government. That's the reason. And if this bill is adopted, which will be independent of the budget, then we are going to organize a feast that evening. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Prime Minister.
Prime Minister asks that you remain in, his, in your seats until he and delegation have left. They have an appointment at the Treasury at 2 o'clock and must leave immediately, so please sit still for a little while. We were very honored. Market levels, and he's seeking to privatize as many state-run companies and industries as he can. Prime Minister Horn also encourages as much foreign investment in his country as he can, which is a principal reason for his visit to the United States this week. Indeed, Mr. Horn fits in well with today's Washington. Given his recent program, he might even qualify as a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> to emphasize the capitalist nature of his visit, Mr. Horn is accompanied by Finance Minister Laios Bakros and Central Bank President George Saranyi. They are regarded as the dream team the intellectual brain trust behind the new financial program. Hungary indeed holds particular appeal for foreign investors. It has attracted almost 50% of all foreign investment in the Central European region since democracies there began to cast off the Soviet yoke some six years ago. And most of that foreign investment has come from the United States. Martin Chase, Kiplinger Washington Editors, and Douglas Harbre Harbrecht of Business Week Magazine. <laughs> Our speaker today is a most intriguing individual. He is a former communist. He helped to put down the uprising by Hungarian freedom fighters against Soviet rule in 1956. He is a socialist and heads the Socialist Party in his country. On the surface, these appear to be an improbable set of credentials for the man that Hungarians have chosen to lead them in the new political landscape of Europe that sees the rough and tumble economics of the free market as the avenue to prosperity. Yet, take a close look at what Gula Horn has been doing since he became Prime Minister of his country last July. In March, his government announced an austerity program designed to reduce the annual budget deficit and the public debt. He's proposed cuts in government spending, including spending for welfare. He's letting energy prices rise to more. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Monroe Carmen. I'm president of the Press Club and editor-at-large at Bloomberg Business News. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, as well as those of you watching on C-SPAN or listening to this program on National Public Radio or the Global Internet Computer Network. Uh, before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of some upcoming speakers. Tomorrow, June 8th, film critics Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert will mark the 20th anniversary of their television show with their view of the state of the movie industry. And speaking of movies, on Friday, June 16th, actress Sharon Stone, who will be in town for the annual National Race for the Cure, will talk about wellness, fitness, and a positive attitude. And on Thursday, June 22nd, Robert Wright, the president of NBC, will discuss television in the changing society. Transcripts and audio and video tapes of Press Club luncheons are available by calling 1-800-STATES. Mr. Horn has also expressed his interest in having his country join both NATO and the European Union. Hungary 
a landlocked nation of 10 million people, also is very much affected by the current Balkan crisis. That war that is devastating Bosnia could spill over into other countries in the area, including Hungary, despite the best efforts of Europeans to isolate the battle. Perhaps Mr. Horn will give us his views on the appropriate American role in Bosnia. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the National Press Club podium the Prime Minister of Hungary, Gula Horn. Elnök úr, hölgyeim és uraim, köszönöm szépen ezt az ismertetést. Ez igaz. And that is true. Még az igazság a szélesebb és teljesebb is. Uh, even though Még the truth is wider az, and broader based, I agree a that a I could quite easily uh, become an a re a uh, Republican. Nos, három is. NPC 2334, that's a new number, 1 800 NPC 2334. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions for our speakers, please write them on the cards that are provided at your table. Pass them up to me and I will ask as many as time permits. And now I'd like to introduce our head table and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. From your right, uh, Cynthia Ramsey of the American Petroleum Institute. Llewellyn King, Publisher King Publishing Group. Maria Riccio, Fort Worth Star Telegram. Donald Blinken, the U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Hungary. Richard Whittle of the Dallas Morning News. Uh, Mr. Bakros, the Minister of Finance of the Republic of Hungary, has not been able to arrive yet, but we hope he still will join us during the program. Uh, skipping over our speaker, Mark Johnson, Media General News Service and Chairman of the NPC Speakers Committee. Uh, Georgi uh, Banlaki, Ambassador the, of the Republic of Hungary. Uh, Bill Hickman, a member of the National Press Club uh, Speakers Committee who arranged today's luncheon. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Nancy Dunn of the Financial Times.